our docket. This is IT 9833I, the prosecutor of the tribunal against Radislav Kirstic. For the time being, please be seated, uh, Mr. Kirstic. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to have the representatives for both of the parties. First, the prosecution. Good morning, Your Honors. I am Brenda Hollis, and along with my colleagues, Mr. Peter McCloskey and Ms. Ann Sutherland, we appear on behalf of the prosecutor. Merci. Thank you. Let me turn to the de to defense counsel for Mr. Kirstich. Microphone, please. Miss, Mr. President and distinguished members of the tribunal, my name is Nenad Petrosic, a lawyer from Belgrade, member of the Lawyers' Chamber, and I have been chosen to defend General Kirstic. Je vous, je vous remercie. Thank you. The, today's hearing is an initial appearance, which is carried a further to the rules of procedure and evidence in effect at the International Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and this fo always follows the arrest of an accused. Uh, in this case, the accused is Mr. Kirstic, who is now going to rise and uh, tell us his name, his given name, his place and date of birth, his profession, and his domicile up to the point of his arrest. Uh, please proceed. My name is General Lieutenant Colonel Radislav Krstic. I am the commander of the 5th Corps of the Army of the Republika Srpska. I was born on the 15th of February 1948 in Vlasenica, Bosnia-Herzegovina. Before I was arrested, I performed the, my duties in Sokolac, and my family lives in Belgrade. Thank you. You may be seated for the time being. What, what was his rank? The interpretation said General Curlin. Colonel, could you explain that to me, please? Are you a general what or you a colonel name? in the Republic of Srpska Army? General Pot. I am Lieutenant General of the Army of the Republic of Srpska. Yeah, merci. Very well, thank you. You may be seated for the time being. Let me remind you that Further to the texts in effect at the International Criminal Tribunal, I will read some relevant passages from the statute and will ask the Registrar to read the relevant uh, passages from the Rules of Procedure and Evidence. I would like to recall that further to the statute of the International Criminal Tribunal, specifically Articles 21 and 22, all persons against whom, indi against whom indictments have been confirmed, which is the case in here, and further to an order for a warrant of arrest, which is issued by the International Criminal Tribunal to arrest, and the accused must be informed of the accusations against that person and then to be transferred to the International Criminal Tribunal, which is the case today. Furthermore, the trial chamber must read the indictment and to be sure that the rights of the accused have been respected, to confirm that the accused understood the contents of the indictment and ask him to plead guilty or not guilty. And the trial chamber will then set the date for the trial. There are other relevant passages re relating to the rights of the accused. That is Article 21. One, two, three, four. The person shall be informed of the charges against him. Informed promptly and in detail in a language which he understands of the nature and cause of the charge against him. To have adequate time and facilities for the preparation of his defense and to communicate with counsel of his own choosing. And to be tried, of course, to be without undue delay, to be tried in his presence. And if he does not have counsel, to be informed of his right to have counsel. And if he does not, the tribunal will assign one to him. It is under those conditions that Mr. Pestrosich, Mr. Pestrosich, excuse me for mispronouncing your name, was appointed 
did the registry appoint you, Mr. Pesvisic, or was it the accused who appointed you? Please rise and tell us under what conditions you were appointed. Mr. President, I was elected by General Kirstic to act as his defense counsel. And if we're talking about language, the official language of the tribunal, and as you have mentioned that rule, I would like to say a few words in that regard, if I may. If you will allow me to do so, yes. you do. Thank you very much. I know that according to the rules of the tribunal, the official language used is English or French. I speak neither of these two languages, but I do hope that this trial chamber will allow me to do use Serbian, the Serbian that the, the language that the accused uses, and all further correspondence and anything in writing, any written documents necessary, and in the briefs, and will be in one of the official languages of this tribunal. So in that regard, there will be no difficulty in communicating, that is, between the defense and the tribunal. Thank you. Thank you. Turning to the prosecutor, will that cause any problems? That is the fact that the defense counsel does not speak either of the two official languages of the tribunal? Your Honors, given the qualification that Defense Counsel just announced, and that is that pleadings and correspondence um, and other written submissions would be in one of the official languages of the tribunal, uh, it would seem that the only thing that would be only in the Serbian language would be presentations made uh, in court or in other proceedings, and the prosecution would have no objection to that. Well, thank you. I think that there's no objection from my colleagues. Under, the, under those conditions, we can continue with the hearing provided for also in Rule 62 of our Rules of Procedure and Evidence. Turning to the register, we'll ask him to read that rule. Please read it slowly so that the accused can understand what is being said in his own language. Rule 62, initial appearance of accused. Upon the transfer of an accused to the seat of the tribunal, the President shall forthwith assign the case to a trial chamber. The accused shall be brought before that trial chamber without delay and shall be formally charged. The trial chamber shall, one, satisfy itself that the right of the accused to counsel is respected. Two, read or have the indictment read to the accused in a language the accused speaks and understands and satisfy itself that the accused understands the indictment. Three, call upon the accused to enter a plea of guilty or not guilty on each count. Should the accused fail to do so, enter a plea of not guilty on the accused's behalf. Four, in case of a plea of not guilty, instruct the registrar to set a date for trial. Five, in case of a plea of guilty, Act in accordance with Rule 62 bis. Six, instruct the registrar to set such other dates as appropriate. Thank you very much. Of course, uh, we will read Rule 62 bis only depending upon the plea entered by General Pestrich, which I still don't really understand whether he's a general or a colonel because his defense counsel gives him the rank of general and he himself says colonel. All right, let's move on. D'accord. Bien. Bien. Donc le général Kerstich. All right, General Kerstich. Thank you. We are now going to move to reading the indictment, and this is how we will proceed. The indictment will be read by, read by the register, and when the charges are read, I will ask the accused if he pleads guilty or not guilty. First of all, I would like to be sure by asking Mr. Pesvicic whether as soon as the accused arrived in the 
a detention center that the indictment was given to the accused and that he understood the contents of that indictment. Did he, Mr. Petrosic? Mr. President, in the course of yesterday, I spent four hours talking to my defendant. General Kirstich has received the indictment. He has understood the indictment so that at today's hearing he will be pleading on all the counts contained in the indictment. Merci. Thank you, Mr. Petrusic. The prosecutor to whom I will give the floor has informed the trial chamber that the, in that the indictment that had been issued, among other things, against General Kirstich had been subject to an order for non-disclosure from one of my colleagues who had confirmed it. And this order for non-disclosure might also involve other, indict other people indicted in this uh, indictment and that they be confirmed by the judges as well. I give the floor to the prosecutor. Yes, Your Honors, we would remind you of the existing order uh, that was issued by the confirming judge pursuant to Rule 53, and we would ask that you uh, confirm the ongoing nature of that order as to uh, any other uh, co-accused that may exist. Bien. Are there any comments from the defense, Mr. Petrusic? While the judges deliberate quickly at the bench. I have no objections, Your Honor. Thank you. Let me consult with my colleagues. Merci à mes colleagues. Thank you to my colleagues. The trial chamber this morning confirms that referring to s exceptional circumstances as covered by Rule 53A, which states that in exceptional circumstances, a judge or a trial chamber may, in the interest of justice, order the non-disclosure to the public of any documents or information until further order. We can also, pursuant to Rule 53C, in consultation with the prosecutor, also order that there be no disclosure of an indictment or part thereof, or of all or any part of any particular document or information. The judges note that there is no, uh, no objection from the defense, and that under those uh, conditions, Ms. the registrar is now going to read the indictment against Mr. Kirstich, but only as regards the relevant parts for the accused in this courtroom today. And lastly, let me remind Mr. Kirstich that when I tell him to rise, he will rise, and then the, the charge or charges will be read, and at that point I will ask you whether you intend to plead guilty or not guilty. And after that, we will, in a public session, organize the proceedings that will follow this hearing, which should lead to the trial. If there are no other comments, I will ask the registrar to rise and to read the indictment against Radis. Excuse me, Mr. Pesicic. Yes, go ahead. I apologize to your honors and members of the trial chamber, but Mr. President, when the indictment has been read out and when General Kirstic pleads as to whether he is guilty or not guilty, that he be allowed because of serious injuries, and I'll say a little more about that later on, may he remain seated because if he has to get up, it will be difficult for him, and I beg the court's indulgence in this matter. Any objection from the prosecution? We have no objection, Your Honours. All right. The accused may remain 
seated when he's asked to plead guilty or not guilty. Oh, Lord. Now, turning to the registrar, would you plead, please read the indictment against the accused this morning? This is IT 9833I, the prosecutor against Radislav Kirstich. Indictment. The prosecutor of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, pursuant to her authority under Article 18 of the Statute of the Tribunal, charges Radislav Kirstic with genocide, crimes against humanity, and violations of the laws or customs of war, as set forth below. Background. After armed conflict erupted in the Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina in the spring of 1992, Bosnia and Serb military and paramilitary forces occupied cities, towns, and villages in the eastern part of the country and participated in an ethnic cleansing campaign which resulted in an exodus of Bosnian Muslim civilians to enclaves in Srebrenica, Goreshde, and Jepa. On 16 April 1993, the Security Council of the United Nations, acting pursuant to Chapter 7 of its Charter, adopted Resolution 819, in which it demanded that all parties to the conflict in the Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina treat Srebrenica and its surroundings as a safe area, which was to be free from any armed attack or any other hostile act. On, on or about 6 July 1995, units of the Drina Corps of the Bosnian Serb Army, the VRS, shelled Srebrenica and attacked Dutch-manned United Nations observation posts, which were located in the safe area. The Drina Corps attack on the Srebrenica safe area continued through 11 July 1995, when forces from the Drina Wolves, the Bratunac Brigade, and other units of the VRS entered Srebrenica. The Bosnian Muslim men, women, and children who were in Srebrenica after the beginning of the VRS attack took two courses of action. Several thousand women, children, and some mostly elderly men fled to the UN compound in Potocari, located within the safe area of Srebrenica, where they sought the protection of the Dutch battalion. The Bosnian Muslim civilians remained in and around Potocari from 11 July until 13 July 1995, when they were evacuated by buses and trucks under the control of the VRS. A second group of approximately 15,000 Bosnian Muslim men, with some women and children, gathered as a Shushnyari, village near Srebrenica during the evening of 11 July 1995 and fled in a huge column through the woods toward Tuzla. Approximately one-third of this group consisted of armed Bosnian Muslim military personnel. The rest were unarmed military personnel and civilians. On or about 12 July 1995, Ratko Mladic and Radislav Kirstic, as well as other VRS and Bosnian Serb civilian representatives, met in the Hotel, Hotel Fontana in Bratunac with Dutch military officers and representatives of the Bosnian Muslim refugees from Potocari. At this meeting, Radko Mladic explained to the group that he would supervise the evacuation of refugees from Potocari and wanted to see all the Bosnian Muslim men between approximately the ages of 16 and 60 to screen for possible war criminals. 
on or about 12 July 1995, in the presence of Radko Mladic and Radislav Kirstic, approximately 50 to 60 buses and trucks arrived near the UN military compound in Potuchari. Shortly after the arrival of these vehicles, the deportation process of Bosnian Muslim refugees started. As Bosnian Muslim women, children, and men started to board the buses and trucks, Bosnian Serb military personnel separated the men from the women and children and detained the men in and around Potocari. Between the evening of 11 July 1995 and the morning of 12 July 1995, the Bosnian Muslims who had gathered in Shushnyari formed a huge column and began their trek through the woods towards Tuzla. Bosnian Serb forces, supported by armored personnel carriers, tanks, anti-aircraft guns and artillery, positioned themselves along the Bratunac Milici road in an attempt to intercept the column. Some of the armed members of the retreating column of Bosnian Muslims engaged in combat with the Bosnian Serb forces. Thousands of Bosnian Muslims from the retreating column were captured by, or surrendered to, Bosnian Serb military forces under the command and control of Radko Mladic and Radislav Kustic. Between 11 July 1995 and 18 July 1995, VRS forces under the command and control of Radko Mladic and Radislav Kirstic participated in numerous incidents of opportunistic killings of Bosnian Muslim men shortly after they had been captured, as well as systematic summary executions of Bosnian Muslim men who were initially detained and then transported to various execution sites throughout the territory under the control of the VRS Drina Corps. The VRS forces, under the command and control of Ratko Mladic and Radislav Kirstic, executed thousands of Bosnian Muslim men. Between 10 July 1995 and 18 July 1995, the VRS forces, under the command and control of Radko Mladic and Radislav Kirstic, either expelled or killed most of the members of the Bosnian Muslim population of the Srebrenica enclave. As a result of these actions, the VRS forces virtually eliminated the presence of any Bosnian Muslims in the Srebrenica enclave area, thus continuing an ethnic cleansing campaign which had begun in the spring of 1992. The accused. Radislav Kustic was a lieutenant colonel in the JNA before the armed conflict in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Kustic served as commander of the 2nd Romania Motorized Brigade, which was first a component of the Sarajevo Romania Corps, but was later transferred to the Drina Corps in November 1992. He continued to serve as the commander of the brigade until late 1994. From January 1995 through 14 July 1995, he was the chief of staff, deputy commander of the VRS Drina Corps. He was promoted to the rank of major general in June 1995. On or before 14 July 1995, he assumed command of the Drina Corps. His assumption of command was publicly announced on 20 July 1995. In April 1998, he was promoted to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel General and is currently the commander of the VRS 5th Corps in Sokolats. 
superior authority. When the Srebrenica operation began on or about 16, 6 July 1995, Radislav Kirstich held the rank of general major with the position of chief of staff, deputy commander of the Drina Corps. As Chief of Staff Deputy Commander of the Drina Corps, Radislav Kirstich was responsible for directing the activities of the Corps staff. He was responsible for monitoring the activities of all units and activities within the Corps zone of responsibility and also acted as advisor to his Corps commander. As Chief of Staff, he was concurrently the Corps Deputy Commander empowered to give orders on behalf of the commander in his absence and to give supplementing orders to ensure implementation of the commander's orders. When Radislav Kirstich became the commander of the Drina Corps on or before 14 July 1995, his responsibilities increased to include planning and directing the activities of all subordinate units in his zone of responsibility and monitoring their activities to ensure his orders were implemented. General allegations. At all times relevant to this indictment, a state of armed conflict existed in the Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina. At all relevant times, Radislav Kirstic was required to abide by the laws and customs governing the conduct of war. All acts and omissions charged as crimes against humanity were part of a widespread or systematic attack directed against the Bosnian Muslim civilian population of Srebrenica and its surroundings. Radislav Kirstic is individually responsible for the crimes alleged against him in this indictment pursuant to Article 7.1 of the Tribunal Statute. Individual criminal responsibility includes committing, planning, instigating, ordering or otherwise aiding and abetting in the planning preparation or execution of any crimes referred to in Articles 2 to 5 of the Tribunal Statute. Radislav Kirstic is also, or alternatively, criminally responsible as a commander for the acts of his subordinates pursuant to Article 7.3 of the Tribunal Statute. Such criminal responsibility is the responsibility of a superior for the acts of his subordinates if he knew or had reason to know that his subordinate was about to commit such acts or had done so and the superior failed to take the necessary and reasonable measures to prevent such acts or to punish the perpetrators thereof. The general allegations contained in paragraphs 14 through 18 are realleged and incorporated into each of the charges set forth below. Charges. Counts 1 and 2, genocide, complicity to commit genocide. Between about July 1995 and 1 November 1995, Radislav Kirstich intending to destroy a part of the Bosnian Muslim people as a national, ethnical, or religious group, A, killed members of the group, and B, caused serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. Between about 11 July 1995 and 1 November 1995, Radislav Kirstic planned instigated, ordered, or otherwise aided and abetted in the planning, preparation, or execution of the opportunistic killings of captured Bosnian Muslim men from the Srebrenica safe area by VRS military personnel. Between about 11 July 1995 and 1 November 1995, Radislav Kirstic planned 
instigated, ordered, or otherwise aided and abetted in the planning, preparation, or execution of a planned and organized mass execution of thousands of captured Bosnian Muslim men from the Serenica safe area. The wide-scale and organized killing of Bosnian Muslim men, which occurred in several different locations in and around the Srebrenica enclave from 11 July 1995 until 18 July 1995, included Potocari. Between 12 July 1995 and 13 July 1995, VRS military personnel under the command of Radislav Kirstich summarily executed Bosnian Muslim men at diverse locations around the UN compound at Potocari, where the Bosnian Muslim men had taken refuge. Kravica. On or about 13 July 1995, VRS soldiers, under the command of Radislav Kirstich, summarily executed hundreds of Bosnian Muslim men who had been imprisoned in a large warehouse in the village of Kravica. The VRS soldiers used automatic weapons, hand grenades, and other weaponry to kill the Bosnian Muslims inside the warehouse. Bratunac. Between 12 July 1995 and 14 July 1995, VRS military personnel, under the command of Radislav Kirstich, transported many of the Bosnian Muslims who had been detained in Potocari or captured along the Bratunac Milici Road to locations in and around Bratunac, where they were held in schools, buildings, and vehicles parked along the road. Between 12 July 1995 and 15 July 1995, VRS military personnel under the command of Radislav Kirstich participated in numerous opportunistic killings of the detained Bosnian Muslim men at various locations throughout Gratunac. Tisha. On or about 12 July 1995 and 13 July 1995, VRS military personnel under the command of Radislav Kirstich transported the Bosnian Muslim men, women and children who had been separated from male members of their families in Potocari to an area near Tisha village. Most of the Bosnian Muslim women and children driven to Tisha were permitted to cross into Bosnian Muslim territory. However, VRS military personnel under the command of Radislav Kirstich identified and separated Bosnian Muslim men and some Bosnian Muslim women. On or about 12 July 1995 and 13 July 1995, the VRS military personnel forced the Bosnian Muslim men and women to walk to a nearby school where they were taunted and assaulted by VRS soldiers. On or about 13 July 1995 and 14 July 1995, VRS military personnel under the command of Radislav Kirstich loaded 25 Bosnian Muslim men onto a truck, drove them to an isolated pasture, and summarily executed them. Rahovac, near Lajite. On or about 14 July 1995, VRS military personnel, under the command of Radislav Kirstich, transported hundreds of Bosnian Muslim men from in and around Pratunac to the Gurbavci school complex near Orahovac. On 14 July 1995, VRS military personnel, under the command of Radislav Kirstich, summarily executed Bosnian Muslim men in and around the school. That same day, 
the VRS military personnel transported the Bosnian Muslim men, many of whom were blindfolded, from the Girbavci school to the nearby village of Orohovac. Once there, VRS military personnel, under the command of Radislav Kirstic, ordered the Bosnian Muslim men off the trucks and executed them. Hundreds of Bosnian Muslim men were killed. On or about 14 and 15 July 1995, VRS military personnel, under the command of Radislav Kirstic, used heavy equipment to bury the victims in mass graves at the execution site while the executions continued. The dam near Petkovci. On or about 14 July 1995, VRS military personnel under the command of Radislav Kirstic transported hundreds of Bosnian Muslim men from detention sites in Gratunac to the school at Petkovci. On 14 July 1995, VRS military personnel, under the command of Radislav Kirstic, summarily executed Bosnian Muslims in and around this school. On or about the evening of 14 July 1995, and in the early morning hours of 15 July 1995, VRS military personnel under the command of Radislav Kirstic transported several hundred Bosnian Muslim men from the school at Petkovci to an area below the dam at Petkovci. These people were unloaded from vehicles, led in small groups to an open area, and summarily executed by VRS military personnel under the command of Radislav Kirstic. Cheska Valley. From on or about 14 July until about 21 July 1995, VRS military personnel under the command of Radislav Kirstic transported over 100 Bosnian Muslim men to an area along a dirt road in the Cherska Valley summarily executed them and covered them with dirt. Pilica. Between 14 and 16 July 1995, VRS military personnel under the command of Radislav Kirstic transported hundreds of Bosnian Muslim men from detention sites in Bratunac to the school at Pilica. VRS military personnel, under the command of Radislav Kirstic, summarily executed many of the Bosnian Muslim men who were being detained at the Pilica school. Branjevo Farm. On or about 16 July 1995, VRS military personnel, under the command of Radislav Kirstic, transported reported hundreds of Bosnian Muslim men from the Pilica school to the Branjeva farm. The Bosnian Muslim men were unloaded from buses, led in small groups to an open area, and summarily executed with automatic weapons by VRS soldiers from the 10th Sabotage Detachment and other units. On or about 16 and 17 July 1995, the VRS military personnel, under the command of Radislav Kirstic, using heavy equipment, buried hundreds of victims in a nearby mass grave. Pilica Cultural Center. On or about 16 July 1995, VRS military personnel, under the command of Radislav Kirstic, after participating in the Branjevo farm executions, traveled a short distance to the village of Pilica. There, using automatic weapons and hand grenades, 
VRS military personnel summarily executed approximately 500 Bosnian Muslim men inside the Pilica Cultural Center. Koshluk. On or about 16 and 17 July 1995, VRS military personnel under the command of Radislav Kirstic transported hundreds of Bosnian Muslim men to an isolated place near Kozluk and summarily executed them. On or about 18 July 1995, VRS military personnel under the command of Radislav Kirstic, using heavy equipment, buried the victims in a mass grave nearby. During and after the opportunistic killings and mass executions, which occurred from 11 July until 18 July 1995, Radislav Kirstic failed to investigate or punish any of his VRS subordinates who were responsible for the killings and executions. To the contrary, Radislav Kirstic and units under his command participated in an organized and comprehensive effort to conceal and cover up the killings and executions by burying the bodies of the victims in isolated sites scattered throughout a wide area. When it became apparent that the international community had learned of the killings and executions arising from the attack on the Srebrenica safe area, Radislav Kirstic and units under his command participated in a second attempt to conceal the killings and executions by digging up the bodies from the initial mass graves and transferring them to secondary graves. VRS military personnel or their agents, under the command of Radislav Kirstic, dug up the following graves and transferred the bodies to secondary sites. the dam at Petkovci, Orlohovac, Branjewe Farm, Kozluk, Glokova. Thank you, Regis. I want to ask you to stop for a moment. Let me turn to the accused, Mr. Kirsches. Please remain seated. The counts will now be read out, and this is the point that I'm going to ask you, as my colleagues do, you to tell us whether you plead guilty or not guilty. First, let me ask you whether you feel well enough. Have you understood the indictment, and did you learn of it when you reached the uh, detention center? When you reached, and did you feel all right when you got there? Then I'm going to ask you to plead guilty or not guilty to each of the counts. Or you may remain seated. May answer my question, please. Do I have the right to speak? I have no interpretation. I'm sorry. The interpreter apologizes. She heard it wrongly. I have Do no you hear interpretation, me? said the accused. Do you hear me? Do you hear me, Mr. Petricic? Da, da, true. Yes, I can hear you very well, Your Honor. Uh, just one moment to clarify the matter. Do you hear me now, Mr. Kirstic? Uh, D'accord. Yes, yes. Uh, you, you, did you hear the indictment? Were you uh, connected properly? I have heard the indictment, except for the last two paragraphs. On va demander au greffier de répéter les deux derniers paragraphes, c'est le paragraphe 24 et le paragraphe 25. Ask the register to repeat the reading of those, please. That's paragraphs 24 and 25. And then tell us immediately whether you hear. During and after, do you hear? Very well. Go ahead. During and... During and after the opportunistic killings and mass executions, which occurred from 11 July until 18 July 1995, Radislav Kirstic failed to investigate or punish any of his VRS subordinates who were responsible for the killings and executions. To the contrary, Radislav Kirstic and units under his command 
participated in an organized and comprehensive effort to conceal and cover up the killings and executions by burying the bodies of the victims in isolated sites scattered throughout a wide area. You don't have to tell us, we don't have to mention the paragraphs. Move on to the next one, please. When it became apparent that the international community had learned of the killings and executions arising from the attack on this Rebrenitz's safe area, Radislav Kirstich and units under his command participated in a second attempt to conceal the killings and executions by digging up the bodies from the initial mass graves and transferring them to secondary graves. The RS military personnel or their agents, under the command of Radislav Kirstich, dug up the following graves and transferred the bodies to secondary sites. The dam at Petkovci, or Rahovac, the Branyevo farm, Kozluk, Glokova. Thank you. Let me once again turn to the accused. You've now heard the indictment, and you will tell us, please, whether you plead guilty or not guilty to each of the counts that the registrar will read from the indictment. I would first of all ask you to do the following. First, I'd like to ask how you feel physically. Do you feel all right uh, other than the fatigue you feel in your leg? How do you feel? As well as can be accept expected on the whole, but I am tired after the arrest, exhausted. At the detention center, the people are very correct in their treatment of us all and particularly to me, myself. In, there has been no heating in the detention unit, however, for the past three days. And that is something which makes the uh, circumstances impossible and with regard to hygiene as well. And in view of my injuries, I have no conditions for therapy for my leg and for the care and attention of my health. So much from me. Thank you. Very well. Merci, et vous avez bien fait de le signer. Thank you. I appreciate you having pointed this out. This will be indicated in our records to the registrar and to the head of the detention unit. I think it's absolutely important to have heating at this time of the year, which, of course, this applies to all of the accused, and more particularly to the accused and to other treatment he should get. Let us now move back to the indictment. Mr. Kirstich, first of all, we'll ask the register to continue reading the indictment, and then I'll ask you to plead guilty or not guilty. Counts. By his respective acts and omissions described in paragraphs below, Radislav Kirstich committed. Count one, genocide, punishable under Articles 4.3a and 7.1 and 7.3 of the Statute of the Tribunal, and alternatively, count two, complicity to commit genocide, punishable under Articles 4.3e and 7.1 and 7.3 of the Statute of the Tribunal. Very well. I'm turning to you, Mr. Kirstich. I'm going to ask you for these two counts, which are listed alternatively. You were either accused of genocide or complicity to commit genocide by the prosecutor. We will see the results of that during the trial, but for the time being, we simply ask you to plead guilty or not guilty. I plead not guilty. Merci, ceci. Thank you. This will be placed into the registrar's records. Continue, please. Count three, extermination. The prosecutor reledges and reincorporates by reference the paragraphs below. By his respective acts and omissions described in the paragraphs below, Radislav Kirstich committed 
Count three, extermination, a crime against humanity, punishable under Articles 5b and 7.1 and 7.3 of the Statute of the Tribunal. Mr. Kirstich, do you plead guilty or not guilty? I plead not guilty. Please continue. Counts four and five, murder. The prosecutor re-alleges and refers to the allegations in the following paragraphs. By his respective acts and omissions described in the paragraphs below, Radislav Kirstic committed, count four, murder, a crime against humanity, punishable under Articles 5A and 7.1 and 7.3 of the Statute of the Tribunal. Mr. Kirstic, do you plead guilty or not guilty? I plead not guilty. Count five, murder. A violation of the laws or customs of war, punishable under Article 3 and 7.1 and 7.3 of the Statute of the Tribunal, as recognized by Article 3.1a of the Geneva Convention. Do you plead guilty or not guilty? I plead not guilty. Chef six. Count six. Persecutions. The prosecutor realleges and refers to the allegations contained in the following paragraphs. Beginning on 11 July 1995 and continuing through 1 November 1995, Radislav Kirstic committed, planned, instigated, ordered, or otherwise aided and abetted the planning, preparation, or execution of a crime against humanity, that is, the persecutions of Bosnian Muslim civilians on political, racial, or religious grounds in Srebrenica and its surroundings. The crime of persecutions was perpetrated, executed, and carried out by or through the following means. A. The murder of thousands of Bosnian Muslim civilians, including men, women, children, and elderly persons. B. The cruel and inhumane treatment of Bosnian Muslim civilians, including severe beatings. C. The terrorizing of Bosnian Muslim civilians, and D, the destruction of personal property of Bosnian Muslims. By these acts or omissions, and the acts and omissions described in the above paragraphs, Radislav Kirstic committed, count six, persecutions on political, racial, and religious grounds, a crime against humanity, punishable under Article 5H and 7.1, and 7.3 of the Statute of the Tribunal. Done this 30th day of October 1998 at The Hague, the Netherlands, signed by the Deputy Prosecutor Graham T. Blewett. There is a final count. I would like to know as regards count six, the accused pleads guilty or not guilty. Persecutions on political... I plead not guilty. Bien, le tribunal. Very well. The tribunal has noted that the accused has pleaded not guilty to all of the counts in the indictment. And at this point, we will now, working with the, consulting with the prosecutor and the defense, try to set the date for the trial. We are covered by Rule 62, and we must now organize the proceedings that will follow now in order to set as possible as quickly as possible, a date for the trial to begin. Madam Prosecutor, you have several uh, obligations which begin today, which are covered by Rule 62 and following in the Rules of Procedure and Evidence. Have you satisfied all of your obligations, s which would allow us to set the date for the trial as quickly as possible? Your Honor, in regard to our obligation under Rule 66A, on Friday we provided the supporting material relevant to this accused to the translation section of the registry for translation into the language of the accused. Today we are prepared to provide 
to the defense counsel the English version of the supporting material that was provided for confirmation. We believe that there may be a, a videotape that would possibly qualify as a statement of the accused under Rule 66AI. We have yet to view that videotape. As soon as we view it and determine that it does qualify under that section of the rules, we will promptly provide a copy of that to the defense counsel. Mr. Petrosich, have you received all of the supporting material which is covered under Rule 66, A, little i? Mr. President, during the course of the morning, about two hours ago, the only thing I did receive from the registrar are the rules of the International Tribunal. And I also received the statute, that is to say, the rules and the statute of this tribunal. I did not receive any additional supporting material. And then, of course, the indictment was there, too, the indictment that I was given by the accused yesterday when I saw him. So we did not receive any supporting materials. We cannot make any statements in this regard. And I hope that the prosecutor shall provide these materials so that the defense could also start uh, collecting their materials. And as far as the tape that the prosecutor speaks of, I think it is too early for us to state our views on this because I have my doubts as to whether this can be evidence or not. But we are going to state our views on this when the prosecutor submits this. Thank you. I'm not sure I quite understood that. All right, uh, Mrs. Madam Prosecutor, you have 30 days to disclose all of the supporting material to the, uh, with the indictment. You say you've already done that? Before the accused in English, we do not have the copy in the accused language, but we have that here pro uh, prepared to provide that to the uh, defense attorney at the conclusion of these proceedings. Yeah. Bon. Very well. Uh, Mr. Pestridge, uh, you will receive them uh, today. Does that mean in your mind, uh, Mrs. Uh, Hollis, that you don't need the 30-day time period? That Do you feel that you already rest? satisfied your obligations under Rule 66A, a small I. I'm saying that so that we can – I'm talking about the supporting material. I would like to uh, expedite the beginning of the trial. Aside from the video cassette, you have are you, have you already or are you going to submit everything? We're going to submit the uh, supporting material the relevant to this accused today at the conclusion of the proceedings, but they will be in English. Uh, as we read the current rule, Your Honor, they have to be provided in a language the accused understands. We have submitted them for translation, but we do not have the translated copies back uh, as of today in Serbian. Uh, and I'm not sure when the translation section will have that available for us. But we do have the English version here, and we'll serve that on the uh, accused counsel today. Bien, je... All right, let me turn to my colleagues. We could consider that the 30-day time limit today will suffice for the translations. You say that you have given the supporting material with the indictment, not in a language that the accused understands, but that we can use the 30-day time period starting today, 7 December, that is, takes us to the 7th of January, so that all of the documents will have been translated. Mr. Petrich, do you agree with that, or can we speed up the translation process? process? I agree with that proposal. Very well. Uh, then we can use that 30-day period. There's a second time period, uh, Madam Prosecutor. How about, about how many witnesses do you plan to call to this trial? If I may take a moment to confer.
Oui, vous avez... Do you have an uh, approximate idea? I could give you a very rough estimate, and this would, of course, um, depend in part on what happens with our control. Con yes, of course. Uh, we would estimate uh, somewhere in the vicinity of 50 to 70 witnesses, Your Honor. Je vous remercie. Je me tourne. Thank you. Let me turn to the defense. Let me also tell the defense that it will have a time period for filing any uh, preliminary motions that it uh, may care to do. Once you have received all of the uh, all the text, all the, the documents filed under according to the appropriate rules, if by 7th of January you have received all of the statements, you will have to file your preliminary motions. Uh, before the 7th of February. With that. Very well. And from that point on, of course, we cannot say how long, well, whether you're going to file any preliminary motions, that depends on you, not on the judges. I don't know whether the judges can will be able to respond in the f next few days. It also will depend upon the legal substance of the preliminary motions. But can we today say that a trial around the end of March, the beginning of April, would be possible? Approximativement. About. On behalf of the prosecutor, Your Honor, yes, that would be possible. Mr. Petrocic. Mr. Petrocic. On behalf of the defense, it is very difficult indeed at this point in time to estimate when the trial could begin. And the defense shall certainly result to all the rights vested in it in Rule 72 of the Rules of Procedure and Evidence. And as the proceedings further evolve, we shall also draw on Rule 65. So today, I did expect to see piles of documents provided by the prosecutor, and we do not have a single shred of material from them. I repeat that it is unrealistic to set a time, whether it is going to be March or April, as you said, but the defense cannot really say what period of time they would need to prepare their defense, because we do not have a single shred of evidence from the prosecutor so that we could speak about the date of beginning of the trial. I hope you understand this, Mr. President. Yes, we understand what you've just said, but I'd like to say on behalf of my colleagues that the prosecutor will be ready. That's the first observation, that the trial will begin as soon as possible. You have time periods which allow you to file a certain number of preliminary motions, and this is the right of the accused to file them and to raise them. But it will take time, it's your right, but that, of course, will postpone the date of the trial. And the judges must be prepared to move forward as quickly as possible as well. The tribunal is very occupied at this time, but thanks to the fact that we have received some additional judges, our schedule is reasonable and is possible to work with despite the workload of other cases. I don't think we can say any further than that today. The status conferences will determine the legal follow-up to what has been said today, and the trial chamber has designated uh, Judge Admiral Rodriguez as the pretrial judge. Let me remind you that the status conferences in cases is a new procedure whose purpose is to accelerate the beginning of the trial itself. Let me re refer you both prosecution and defense, to 65 bis and uh, uh, 73 uh, bis and tear of the rules of procedure and evidence. Do you have any other comments you'd like to make, uh, Madam Prosecutor? No, Your Honor, we do not. Maître Petrucci. Mr. Petrucic, do you have any comments you'd like to make? Mr. President, since you have already asked about these comments, 
both of the prosecutor and for myself, allow me to make a comment. In all the uh, trials before this tribunal, uh, tribunal where military persons were indicted, always the name of the accused was preceded by his rank. I'm talking about Colonel Krasmanovich, General Djukic, and now General Blaskic too. However, in the indictment of General Krstic, his rank has not been mentioned, and I choose to interpret this as an accidental omission. I also wish to point out, with your permission, something that is really within the province of work of the registry of this tribunal, and that is to say the truly seriously imperiled he health of General Krstic. A leg of his was amputated and there is atrophy of the muscle in the remaining part of the leg and there is bleeding too and Mr. Krstic is rightly pointing to the threat of gangrene but the registry of this tribunal is going to deal with this problem. However, this is very serious and the consequences that may follow are very serious and I wish this to be noted officially. Thank you. I believe that the registrar or the can tell that the accused was already examined. This is ordinarily done. Yes, he was examined when he arrived on the 3rd of December at his arrival in The Hague. He was taken to the hospital where he was examined by a cardiologist. Very well. Your comments have been noted. And if the accused needs any specific type of treatment, this is a possibility which we've run into before in this tribunal. And the proper treatment will be given to the accused. Before we finish our work today, I'd like to turn to my colleagues to ask whether they have any comments. And perhaps give the final word to the accused. Have you any statement you'd like to make, Mr. Kirstich, or General Kirstich? Before you answer, Madam Prosecutor, you c call the prosecutor what? General? Apparently he's a general. Do you call him, do you call him Colonel? General? What is your reaction to the defense's comment? Your Honor, our understanding is that the accused is a lieutenant general um, in the Republic of Srpska Army, that indeed he does hold a general rank and that it is the rank of lieutenant general. Yes, but what I want to know is that in the indictment, the indictment that was read, he's referred to as Mr. Kerstich. For my part, I have no problem to the military ranks being included or once they've, or they've been legitimately accepted and agreed to by the proper authorities. You call him Mr. Kirtic, or should we call him General Kirtic? What is your opinion on that? We would uh, refer to him as uh, General Kirtic if we referred to him uh, other than by his last name. And in the description of the accused, we do include his military rank. Bien, uh, Very well. Mr. Petricic, I suppose that satisfies you. Satisfies you. Before we give the uh, final word to the accused, it will be noted here as being a general, General Kerstic. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I am satisfied. And I note that the accused is also claiming his rank in the Army of Republic of Serbska, if he's understood the, if we've understood the comment correctly. General Kerstic, would you like to make any final statement, either seated or standing, before we finish our hearing this morning? Do you have anything, perhaps you've got nothing to add, have you? Not for the time being. Très bien. Dans ces conditions. Very well. The court stands adjourned.